So, what is The Trouble with Black Boys? It's a book by Pedro A. Nogiero. He's a professor at the Steinhardt School of Education at New York University, the executive director of the Metropolitan Center for Urban Education, the co-director institute, study of globalization education in the metropolitan settings. He received the 2008 Race and Gender Equity Award from the Schott Foundation for Public Education. So the trouble with, trouble with black boys and other reflections on race, equity, and the future of public education. Copyright 2008. Black males in American society are in trouble with respect to health, education, employment, income, and overall well-being. All the most reliable data consistently indicate that black males constitute a segment of the population that is distinguished by hardships, disadvantages, and vulnerability by Littles, Bowers, and Gilmore, 2007. Although they comprise a relatively small portion of the American population, Although black children comprise a relatively small portion of the American population, the black people, less than 6%, I thought 17%, 17 okay, black males occupy a large space within the American psyche and imagination. So, uh, throughout much of American history, black males have served as the ultimate other. In literature and film, they've been depicted as villains, con men, and feeble-minded buffoons. Indeed, the image of the black man has sometimes been used to symbolize the very embodiment of violence. Uh, APEL 2004, most often black men have been regarded as individuals who should be feared because of their uncontrolled and unrefined masculinity. And their very presence, particularly when they are encountered in groups, has been regarded as a menace to innocence, particularly white women, and a potential danger to the social order. Uh, African Americans are a threat that must be policed, controlled, and contained. Baker, 1998. Today, the popular image of black males are less extreme, but no less distorted. Black males are omnipresent in the media, but in a departure from the past, they are often idolized as heroes because of their accomplishments in sports and popular music, as they are scorned for their misdeeds, both real and imagined. These newer images of black males may appear to have uh, to be more positive than the ones from the past, but they have not supplanted the more traditional negative characterizations. Rather, the two cohabit the same social and psychological space. For every story devoted to the feats of a black sports hero, there are others where black men are decried as irresponsible fathers, drug dealers, and sexual predators. As cultural theorist Homi Bahawa, 1994, has written in reference to other subordinate groups, societies frequently conjure up phobias and fetishes towards marginalized groups and individuals. In the United States, the stereotypes and images associated with black males have the effect of magnifying the attention and scrutiny directed toward them in ways that result in their being both vilified and valorized and that make living an ordinary life a tremendous challenge. It is ironic that the lead character of Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man is a black man, one who is so marginal and irrelevant that he is literally unseen. Uh, the Invisible Man, Ralph Ellison. Today, black males are anything but invisible or unseen. In fact, they're so predominantly positioned as celebrities and criminals that hardly a day passes when one is not the subject of news in the media. Be it the latent golf tournament victor at Tiger Woods, an act of violence per portrayed by a criminal, or the latest song by Jay-Z, Kanye West, or 50 Cent, the visibility of black males far exceed their actual numbers in American society. For black males, adulation and scorn are often two sides of the same coin. And as we have seen in the cases of O.J. Simpson, Michael Vick, and Michael Jackson, even those who seem to be loved and adored can easily and quickly fall from grace and fi find themselves hated and despised. So I want to check out the, um, I think the population of black folks or African American folks here in Louisville um, it's 40 percent, but I just want to check it out to make sure that's correct. I know Kentucky at one time used to be 25 percent black, and then it's been dwindled down to 7 percent um, um, in the whole state. So Kentucky has a 7 percent African-American rate. But if you were to take away the cities, Lexington, Louisville, and the Covington region, then it drops down to 4 percent. So that means the population of African Americans in Kentucky went from 25% down to 4%.
21 percent. Where well, that's a, a decrease of 21 percent. Where did all the black folks go? What did you white people do? What did you white people do? How much blood you all got on your hands? So much blood. There's so much blood. That's why you gotta stop the racism, white people. No to Confederacy. No to Ku Klux Klan. No to you know all all the racism, neo Nazism, all of it. No to racism. Be an anti-racist. Be a race trainer. You ain't literally white anyways. So I'm checking out Louisville. Louisville, which has a population consolidated, 746,000. I thought it was a million, so it's actually less than a million. Man, that's way louder than I thought it was. So, uh, Greg Fisher's the mayor. Settlement become the city of Louisville, founded in 1778 by George Rogers Clark, named after King Louis the 16th of France, who had his head chopped off at the French Revolution. Um, the Louisville combined statistical area have a population of 1.4 million. That includes Hardin County and Larue County and Scott County in Indiana. So the greater Louisville area is 1.4 million. Louisville is actually seven, seven thousand or so. Seven, about three quarters of a million. Demographics. The uh, 2005-2007 population estimate was 74.8% white, 71.7% non-Hispanic white alone, 22.2% black or African American. So Louisville is 22% African American, 0.06% uh, American Indian, Alaska and Alaska Native, 2% Asian, and 0.1% Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander. So that's that's in. Um, Louisville. So Louisville, and this was, uh, it's actually an increase. 22% African American is, is an increase from 19% of the census of 2000. Uh, so that's uh, the racial makeup of pre merger Louisville. The, the Louisville had consolidated the county of Louisville and the city of Louisville, merged the governments, and most. Every other county in in the state, I mean, except for Lexington, um, there's a city government and there's a county government, which have to vie for power um, amongst, you know, the rural folks and the city folks. But after the merger here uh, in uh, 2003, uh, the city of Louisville had a merger in 2003. They say the area line within pre-merger Louisville had 245,000 people. The racial makeup of pre-merger Louisville is 60% white, 35% black, 2% Asian, 0.2% Native American, 3% other, 2.4% of the people claimed Hispanic ethnicity. So, the 35% um, is what the the before merger was, and after the merger, then the black uh, population become less, I guess, politically significant since I guess they adopted more of the white folks in the rural. Uh, county areas in Jefferson County and uh, Indiana and LaRue and Scott County. So that's that's the racial makeup. It used to be 35 percent, now it's 22 percent. So 22 percent is black or African American in Louisville, 75 percent are white. So three fourths of Louisville are white, which is actually the same makeup uh, as white males are on the police force at a 75 percent rate and 22 houses for every one homeless person is what we're faced with. So we got 10,000 homeless, who, dozens of Fishervilles, dozens of homeless people living in camps out in the middle of the woods just looking to make it and look, looking to succeed. Um, so, uh, you know, all the homeless people, uh, we shouldn't have, that. That's we, clearly capitalism has failed if we got that many homeless people. The land of plenty. I see so many churches all over the place, gargantuan, just beautiful palaces, uh, churches, just huge stained glass windows. How do we have so much churches that supposed to care about the poor people since Jesus was for the poor, and yet so much poverty? It's almost like they don't even give a shit about the poverty. Uh, Catholic Church traditionally were the ones that took in the German immigrants and took in the Mexican immigrants and they're universal so they accepted everybody and they're uh, like Oscar Romero was a, a huge champion of the poor. So
So there, there are uh, instances of heroism uh, within the Catholic Church. So black folks. So the dichotomous nature of the lens through which black males are perceived poses a tremendous problem for ordinary men and boys. The vast majority of black men are not star athletes or glamorous entertainers. Neither are they hoodlums or gangsters. Some new Arabic hip hop. It's a little, a little louder than what I wanted to do. That's all right. That's all right. Okay. So the vast majority of black men are not star athletes or glamorous entertainers. Neither, neither are they hoodlums or gangsters. Yet the images and stereotypes of black males that permeate American society compel all black men and boys to contend with characterizations and. Uh, images that are propagated in the media and with the perceptions that lurk within imaginations. Black males who are everyday fathers, sons, factory workers, college students, professionals, and craftsmen often find that they must prove their trustworthiness and convince others that they are not individuals who should be feared. Unlike men and women from other racial and ethnic groups, black males are rarely seen as individuals in possession of a full range of attributes and flaws, strengths, and weaknesses. The stereotype that shaped the American images of black males are so stark and extreme that even the most ordinary and unexceptional black males find they are forced to contend with the fantasies and fears that others hold towards them. It's important to point out that in certain contexts, predominantly white schools and colleges, for example, black males occasionally encounter stereotypes that might be misconstrued as positive. Among the classmates and instructors, there may be an assumption that black males are inherently gifted athletes, good dancers, and naturally cool. In settings where black males are regarded as novelties rather than threats, they may experience attention that may not be totally negative, especially if they're star athletes. Yet a closer examination of the assumptions operative in such contexts reveals how often they negate attributes uh, such as honesty, integrity, and intellectual ability and serve to limit and constrain the development of a well, well-rounded personality. Moreover, as my colleague Ron Mincy, a six-foot-four professor of economics at Columbia University, pointed out, having others assume you can play basketball is not a compliment when you're considered for a job as a professor or being reviewed for tenure. Still, no matter how annoying some sense about one's athletic ability might be, the negative stereotypes associated with black males are far more onerous burden. How many black men have been stopped for no justifiable reason by police officers because they are said to fit the description of a suspect or because of their mere presence in a public setting evokes fear and suspicion? According to the recently released study by the RAND Corporation, the statistical analysis of police stops in New York City carried out between 2004 and 2006 found that black men were stopped, frisked, and detained by police at a rate that's 50% greater than their representation in the residential census. The stress and humiliation of such experiences undoubtedly take a toll on psychological well-being and serve as a reminder to black men that they would never be judged as individuals. Um, so... So there's a, a lot here. I got two more minutes, so I'll just... For black men, police har harassment is by no means limited to New York City. How many black men have been strangers crossing the street as they walk towards them? Has seen strangers cross the street as they walk towards them? How many? How common is it for black men to be subje uh, subjected to additional scrutiny by a security guard to be asked for per produce extra proof that they have the funds in their account to cover a check or being asked to produce additional identification to make a credit card purchase? My friend and colleague... At Y. Oakham, a professor at Saint, uh, San Francisco State University, was beaten and arrested by campus police when he entered his office at night with his key to retrieve a book while his two young daughters waited for him in the car. Major offenses like this one, as well as minor indignities, are what psychologist Chester Pierce, 1995, for many uh, referred to as microaggressions, are so common and pervasive that for many parents preparing their black sons for the likelihood of an interrogation by the police has become an increasingly regular part of socialization to manhood. Laney Jr., the acclaimed Harvard Law School professor, points out that even she, an upper-middle-class intellectual, cannot shield her son from the threats that black males experience. As a result, she feels compelled to prepare him for the trials and tribulations he may face living in American society. In describing her quandary over how to educate her son about race and racism in the United States, she writes that a failure to acknowledge difference is a failure to prepare him for a world in which his differences may matter, a world in which he walks down the street, white cops may stop him, or other black males may resent him. In both cases because of a potentially deadly combination of racism and machismo. Like many of the other parents, Gunier laments that the burden her son with uh, uh, laments the need to burden her son with an awareness that he may be subjected to harassment and hostility, not because of something he has done, but simply because of the reactions that his race and gender evoke. She resents the need to prepare him 
because she understands by engaging in this form of socialization, she is in effect reinforcing hierarchy and not resisting it. So, some introduction for The Trouble with Black Boys by Pedro Nogueira.